Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the panelists. Welcome to all of you who are viewing or listening. Um, and thank you all for being here. Thanks also to the organizers and the partners of the Aswan Forum for Sustainable Peace and Development. The title of today's event is Advancing Integrated Responses to Climate Security Risks, Global and African Perspectives. My name is Sagal Absher. I am a lawyer, a researcher, and an analyst from the Horn of Africa, and a member of the Climate Security Expert Network, and I will be your moderator today. Across the African continent, the impacts of climate change and its associated security and development risks have become more pronounced. The changing climate and the associated extreme weather events, droughts, cyclones, and locust infestations are undermining the livelihoods of millions of people, increasing food and water insecurity, increasing internal displacement, and exacerbating the risk of violence and recruitment by terror groups such as Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab. Dramatic climate variability places undue pressure on shared natural resources, and carefully calibrated sharing arrangements are thrown off, and the previously adequate dispute resolution mechanisms cannot keep up with intensified competition and conflict. Governments are challenged to respond and adapt effectively, especially in fragile contexts such as the Horn of Africa and the Lake Chad Basin. These climate security risks are further compounded by Africa's relatively low national preparedness and resilience, as well as the considerable financing gap it faces in addressing these impacts and achieving its sustainable development pathways. In response to growing recognition of these devastating impacts, African governments and regional organizations have taken positive steps towards addressing the development and security implications of climate threats. For instance, the African Union has recognized and discussed these risks explicitly within its peace and security architecture, as well as bringing relevant departments under a common umbrella to better coordinate a response. However, much more needs to be done. Accordingly, in the Aswan Forum's overarching theme of action-oriented, forward-looking and forward-leaning solutions, this session will take stock of climate policies and responses in Africa and the role of international support. Our panelists will discuss the challenges, but also the opportunities that are, be found, that are to be found in integrating and addressing climate related risks in development planning, conflict prevention and peace building. And we have here with us today a truly amazing and illustrious panel and let me introduce them now. First, we have with us Sir Nicholas Kay, the COP26 Regional Ambassador for Africa. He's represented the UK for many years in many diplomatic roles including ambassador in Afghanistan, DRC in Sudan, and a special envoy in the Horn of Africa. He's also served with the UN as special representative of the Secretary General, which is when our paths crossed. Mr. Selwyn Hart is a special advisor to the Secretary General on Climate Action and Assistant Secretary General of the Climate Action Team. In addition to being ambassador to the US from Barbados and an executive director at the Inter-American Development Bank, Mr. Hart has served throughout his career in numerous climate change leadership positions, including director of the SG's climate change support team and climate change, chief climate change negotiator for Barbados. We have Mr. Ahmed Yusuf joining us today from Mogadishu, and he's the director general in the Directorate of Environment and Climate Change in the office of the Prime Minister of the Federal Republic of Somalia. He has a long career in public administration and environmental governance, working with government ministries and agencies and international and local NGOs in Somalia. He's also been serving as the Dean of the School of Social Science at East Africa University. Dr. Philip Atupoyefio is with us from the African Union Commission, where he serves as coordinator for the regional strategy for the stabilization, recovery and resilience of Boko Haram affected areas of the Lake Chad Basin region and he's joining us today from Accra. Nisreen El Saim, joining us from Khartoum, is a Sudanese climate activist and climate negotiator. She's a member of the UN's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change and is the chair of the Sudan Youth Organization for Climate Change. Ms. El Saim is a physicist and started working in the climate change field because she wanted to see the link between the science and the policy. Also with us today and um, on your screens, we have two individuals who are joining us as our expert commentators. Dr. Benedict Franke, CEO of the Munich Security Conference, thank you. 
and Dr. Flo Florian Krampe, Director of Climate Change and Risk Program at CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. So very quickly, let me go over the flow today. You're gonna hear from our panelists today. I'm gonna pose a question or two or three to each of you. And then we're gonna hear from our two expert commentators who will respond to the interventions of our panelists. I'll then return to our panelists to give them an opportunity to share some closing remarks and do a wrap up. We do have a tight schedule, so I will ask our speakers and commentators to please stick to your time. And I'll give you a 30 second warning by raising my hand like this when your time's almost up. Um, and please do keep your videos on if you can. But before I turn to our esteemed panel, I'd like to introduce a short video address from His Excellency James Dudridge, Minister for Africa at the United Kingdom Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Could we have the video, please? Could we have sound on the video? Please? Remains incredibly vulnerable. Africa is the continent least responsible for historic and current uh, global emissions, but it remains incredibly vulnerable and in fact is uh, one of the areas of this world that's most affected uh, by the problems of climate change. Changing weather patterns are already having a catastrophic impact across the continent, whether it's erosion, locusts or the spread of cyclones. Um, each extra degree in global warming um, means damaging prospects for food, security, stability, and prosperity. Many of the countries on the African continent face a twin challenge. 12 of the 20 uh, countries most vulnerable to climate change are already affected by armed conflict. And fragility also inhibits a country's natural adaptive capacity to um, reflect the, uh, the effects of climate change. Um, and this renders them further exposed to change. It's a vicious circle uh, around inability to deal with climate and uh, the vortex of fragility. Boris Johnson spoke about these issues at the Security Council last month, almost 15 years after we first brought it uh, to the agenda on the council. We still remain committed to highlighting uh, the plight of the most vulnerable uh, to the uh, problems of climate change and to addressing the risks to international peace and security that this issue raises. Now, building resilience through adaptation is the key. That's why driving uh, action on adaption uh, and resilience is a priority for COP26. COP26 will be an opportunity to champion green economic recovery from COVID-19 across the continent and around the rest of the world. This will drive global action uh, on clean energy, on innovation, on nature-based solutions, and increased access to and availability of climate finance. Now, the UK government wants to work with African countries to encourage greater ambition on adaptation planning, while strengthening complementary efforts across donor countries. This will increase access to climate finance for those communities most vulnerable to climate change. That's why the UK is committed to doubling our international climate finance to 1.6 billion over the next five years. This will help developing countries to take action and pursue low carbon, climate resilient and environmentally sustainable development. And we will host the Climate and Development Ministerial on the 31st of March this year. This event will convene countries and partners on the challenges and priorities of implementing the Paris Agreement and Agenda 2013 on sustainable development in the countries that are most vulnerable to climate change. The UN's Sustainable Development Goal 13 is to take urgent action to tackle climate change. But the reality is that none of the 17 SDGs will be accomplished if we allow our planet to go to pot and be wrecked. It's fundamental that we must do something. The UK, in partnership with our co-chair Egypt, recently launched the Adaptation uh, Action Coalition. This will support countries to transform political commitments into tangible deliveries on the ground. I call on all countries in Africa to join this coalition, to work together on this vital agenda 
It really is a life and death matter. Together, we have the potential to overcome these enormous challenges, but we must work together and we must work together now. So, um, Sir Nicholas Kay, um, the Honourable Minister, uh, said a lot of what I wanted to say. He pointed out that Africa accounts just for a small part of the emissions, even though this continent is one of the most vulnerable. And he highlighted, of course, the importance of adaptation and resilience in the efforts. He also highlighted the importance of financing um, to the continent's priorities. So in light of this, and in your capacity as the COP26 Regional Ambassador for Africa, I'd like to ask how will COP26 provide a platform for advancing climate adaptation and catalyzing innovative finance and investment to close Africa's climate finance gap, which is estimated between seven and $15 billion annually. Sir Nicholas Kay. Great, hello, so Sagal, good to see you. And uh, thank you for moderating us today. Greetings to, to fellow panelists uh, as well. And a big thank you to the Cairo Center for Conflict Prevention and Peacekeeping for organizing the Aswan Forum uh, and for Egypt for hosting. Thank you very much. Um, I, Minister Dudrich, I think, has, has said really, you know, a, an awful lot uh, in his uh, speech. Um, let me just say to start with that, you know, as COP26 regional ambassador to sub-Saharan Africa, my role is, is not really a UK role. I'm acting as part of the presidency for 197 parties to the Paris Convention. And it's on behalf of everyone that I am trying to work to make sure that when we meet in Glasgow in November, Africa's concerns and interests are fully addressed and fully heard in, in Glasgow. For, for the presidency that we're running, the UK's sort of mantra, if you like, is urgency, ambition and inclusion. Uh, urgency, as we know, for all the reasons uh, that uh, are out there, we are facing as a planet a, a, an extinction crisis. And we are behind in what we should be doing in terms of reducing emissions, but also in terms of financing for adaptation, as you say. Uh, and inclusion, because we as the UK as presidency won't do this alone. This is 197 states parties that need to combine and find the right answers when we meet in Glasgow. And it's not just governments, it's civil society, it's business, it's academics, it's scientists, it's everyone that's in this together. So your question on advancing adaptation and catalyzing finance cuts to the heart of some of the most critical issues for Africa, as, as I am told by Africans. Uh, some of the effects, as we know, of climate change are definitely being felt across Africa, causing profound impacts. Uh, and for us as presidency, we want to put adaptation and resilience and climate finance at the top of the agenda for Glasgow. Um, and there is no doubt that we are not doing collectively as the world enough on all of those. Um, I'm very glad that uh, Egypt who hosting the, the Aswan Forum, together with the UK, we've just launched the Adaptation Action Coalition to accelerate action on this agenda and to better enable countries to put climate risk at the center of decision-making. And that uh, Adaptation Action Coalition is uh, open to developed and developing countries and is building greater consensus that adaptation on uh, and ab ambition for adaptation is a key element of climate leadership. So we're meeting now and when we come to, to Glasgow in a context of COVID-19 where we are all deeply conscious of the fragility of human life and of the planet. 
And we are also deeply conscious of the economic impacts of COVID-19 across the world. The reality is there is less money. There will be less money available from donors and there is less money available in developing countries as well. And as we try to recover from the pandemic, um, a lot of effort and is going into ensuring that that recovery is green. And the African Union, I would like to mention as well, their Green Recovery Action Plan, which we believe will be launched next month, and also other work from, for example, the UN Economic Commission for Africa and AMSEN, the African uh, Ministerial Environment Ministers, is all focused on this, making sure that the recovery is green. But money is short, and that is the real, the real challenge. Definitely for COP26, the parties must address achieving the 100 billion that was committed in Paris uh, from donors, which hasn't yet been achieved, but it must be achieved. And there must also be moves to make that money more easily accessible uh, for developing countries. And I think it must also make sure that more of that money goes to adaptation and more of that adaptation money goes to the local level as well. Uh, so to this aim as well, the UK is uh, holding a, uh, a small ministerial meeting on the 31st of March with some of the key uh, donor countries and vulnerable and developing countries to try to work through a suite of potential actions that we can take to increase climate finance, quantity, quality, access, and also the adaptation ambition as well. And so I can say on behalf of the UK presidency of COP26, increasing adaptation priority and increasing quantity and accessibility of finance are very, very key to our presidency. And we've got plenty of opportunity as we go ahead um, from the G7, which we are also a presidency for as the UK, G20 hosted by Italy, and also this year, a Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Rwanda as well. At all these events, we hope that we'll build up that momentum so that when we come together in Glasgow, we shall rise to the challenge of ambition and urgency that the planet needs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sir Nick Kay. That's um, very encouraging to hear the, the strong focus on adaptation and the sort of plan to get us to November to have a very solid conversation about the financing too. Let me now turn to Mr. Hart and the United Nations perspective. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, Mr. Hart. Um, over the past decade, the climate security and development nexus has become more visible across the African continent. For example, seven of the 10 countries most vulnerable and least prepared to deal with climate change host a peacekeeping operation or a special political mission. And climate threats, if not dealt with early or in an anticipatory manner, can aggravate the risks of insecurity, food insecurity, intercommunal tensions, and in displacement. Mindful of this, how does the UN address the climate security interface across its system? Can you tell us about the UN climate security mechanism and also share some examples of how the UN has been successful at ensuring coherence and complementarity when addressing climate threats in fragile and conflict affected settings? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Sagal, and good afternoon um, to the other participants and panelists. Um, it's certainly a pleasure to see so many familiar faces and friends, including my colleague Nizreen, who chairs the Secretary General's um, Youth Advisory Group and who participated um, just last week at um, a debate on climate change and security, which was hosted and chaired by Prime Minister um, Johnson. Um, and and, and um, at this debate on climate change and security, the Secretary General called the climate emergency, the defining issue of our time and said that we needed to urgently step up preparations 
for the escalated implications of climate change for international peace and security. Just one week ago, last Friday, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change issued its initial review of the nationally, nationally determined contributions or the national climate plans that countries had submitted at the end or by the end of last year. It was a very sobering report and the Secretary General called it a red alert for the planet. We are far off track from what we need to limit global increase, the global increase in temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Current commitments from countries put us on a pathway to over three degrees of warming. And the science is very clear. If we are to keep the increase in global average temperature to below 1.5 degrees Celsius, and for us to be on a net zero by 2050 pathway, global emissions need to be reduced by the order 45% by 2030 below 2010 levels. That report that I mentioned earlier showed that the commitments that countries have made thus far just give us less than 1% and we need to get 45. So we are at a critical juncture and um, COP26 and the road to COP26 represents a really critical moment for us to significantly step up global ambition to reduce emissions and to adapt and build resilience to climate change. The impacts that we're seeing now at just 1.2 degrees of warming give, just gives us a glimpse at what lies ahead for all of us. And the unfortunate paradox is that the adaptation challenge for Africa will be much larger if the emissions gap is not closed urgently. Africa is warming faster than the global average. And therefore the consequences for food and water security, human health and socioeconomic development, now severely exacerbated by the pandemic are already being felt across the continent. So therefore improving resilience of communities and national economies and peoples is essential for the continent who has been among the least responsible for the historic GHG emissions. So this must not only be an African priority, it must be an urgent global priority. So you have asked how the UN addresses some complex climate related security risks. First, the UN system, we're enhancing capacity and coverage of analysis, early warning systems, and social protection at national and regional levels. In a previous session of this forum, Under Secretary General Rosemary De Carlo emphasized the need for greater analysis of the multidimensional web of conflict drivers. The gender dimension, for example, of climate security are a critical component of our analysis. For, in, for instance, women make up 60 to 80 percent of smallhold farmers in sub-Saharan Africa, but only constitute 15 to 20 percent of land holders, which deeply undermines their recovery from displacement. Our thinking and responses must account for such observed inequalities, including through well-targeted early warning and gender responsive social nets. Second, we are strengthening partnerships to address the complexity of climate-related security risks. In West Africa and this Sahel, for example, the regional UN office works closely with UN country teams and the economic community for West African states to address climate-related security risks. This includes violence connected to pastoralism, and erosion of social cohesion and increased migration to urban centers. Third, we are prioritizing prevention by working at the nexus of peace building, climate action and resilience. 
The most effective defense, of course, is to prevent the worst impacts of climate change by significantly cutting global emissions. And the Secretary General has been very vocal. He has been calling for a breakthrough on adaptation and resilience. And I'm very encouraged by the words I just heard from Sir Nicholas. The reality is that as it relates to climate finance for adaptation and resilience, less than 20% of total climate, climate finance flows goes towards adaptation and resilience. And this is why the Secretary General has been calling on all donors and the multilateral development banks to increase the share of adaptation and resilience finance to at least 50% of their total climate finance flows and support. And we hope that this could be one of the outcomes that lands at the G7. In addition to G7 and other donors committing to significantly increase um, and double and follow the excellent leadership of the United Kingdom, we're also asking them to balance their adaptation and resilience and mitigation finance flows. And priority needs to go to the most vulnerable, of course, including Africa. Um, and addressing some of the, and we must address many of the access challenges that Africa faces in great, gaining greater access to climate finance. Finally, you asked about the role of the climate security mechanism in all of this. And the mechanism brings together the Department of Political and Peace Building Affairs of um, the United Nations Development Program and the United Nations Environment program with the support of more than 20 other UN entities. The CSM directly supports UN field presences in a range of different settings in Central Africa, for instance. The mechanism is working with the regional um, UN office, the UN country teams, and the economic community of Central African states to advance the first regional climate security risk assessment and develop risk prevention strategies. Early results of this work are promising, but we need to do much more. And of course, we need to do it much faster. So I look forward to discussing um, this with you further. I thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this timely and excellent discussion. And uh, as I said, I look forward to engaging with you and the other panelists over the course of this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hart, um, for your comments. And I hear the theme um, that is running through um, both the panelists of urgency, ambition, and inclusion. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to turn to Mr. Youssef now, joining us from Somalia and offering a national perspective. Um, Mr. Youssef, over the last year, Somalia has grappled with an unimaginable series of crises, including two locust infestations, four floods and cyclones that displaced more than 650,000 people from their homes, and of course the COVID-19 pandemic, which has intensified pressure on Somalia's fragile health and economic systems. The extreme weather events, weather events of course, have an adverse effect on livelihoods and increase the risk of insecurity and violence. Against this complexity of climate threats and the related climate security risks, which are well recognized by your government, as we've seen in Somalia's NDC submission. Can you please share with us the experience of the Somali government in advancing a comprehensive response to climate threats? What are the main challenges and opportunities that you see for integrating climate-related security risks in your long-term national planning and early warning systems? And finally, what are the main areas of, areas of support needed from international actors to advance this work? Over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sagal, and also I would like to thank you all the other uh, uh, participants in this uh, important meeting, which is a SWAM uh, forum. I think you can hear me well first before I start. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, sir. 
Yeah, thanks. So, so thank you so much again. And also great to see that uh, Nicholas Cray, the, 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 the former UN Secretary, uh, I think ambassador in Somalia, back to San Mieris. Uh, uh, great to see this uh, also uh, 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 meeting. I think it, Somalia is facing one of his key roles. Uh, I remember political negotiations that he did when he was in here. So same with that, now he's going with uh, Ambassador, uh, I think it's James Wam, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> so, yeah, so great to see you, please, in this meeting. So coming back to the question that uh, the, the, the Sagal asked me that the, uh, uh, the government of Somalia has uh, created uh, uh, an interdepartmental task force made up of senior government officials uh, representing line government institutions. Uh, all the relevant national and subnational policy documents and strategic plans and other programmatic documentation relevant to the environment and climate change were reviewed analyzing the extent to which these uh, documents make climate adaptation and mitigation a priority to determine the level of uh, contribution of national policy documents and plans to updating of the NDC, Somalia National Determinant Contributions. The review involved understanding uh, the, the current state of the country's environment and climate change institutions. The key outcome of the document review was used as an input for the NDC updates. Uh, the review and the updating process was especially designed to increase the involvement of key stakeholders, such as the private sector, civil society, professionals, expertise, academic institutions, development partners, women and youth associations, and representatives of vulnerable communities. Great uh, engagement of non-stakeholders has been beneficial not only by making the NDC up to date, inclusive and response, but also by validating the process. Following the UNFCC guidelines, Somalia has embarked on a broad consultative review process to the update it is NDC. If I go to the second question that you have asked, which is the, the main challenges and opportunities, uh, in order to integrate a climate security risk is uh, Somalia, the, the, there is a, compre a comprehensive analysis of the state of countries in environmental and climate institutions during the NDC updating process. It revealed that the structural and systematic weakness in the institutional bedrock. This include lack of necessary capacity to address the climate change and it is associated challenges, financial weakness, the death of appropriate policies and inability to enforce laws. This was come after the review of the way we did the institutional review in the process that we realized that there is a lot of challenges. Moreover, most of the institutions suffer from a considerable deficiency in human, financial, organization, and institutional capacity to manage the environment and natural resources and respond to the specific challenges that climate change brought to the Somalia. In the context of lack of the resource, political deficiencies, and lack of solid coordination mechanism, understanding of the total value of the environment and climate change both by the climate change, amongst other things, continue to hinder the efforts to overcome the environmental and climate challenges. Example, in 2017, the government-led drought impact as, uh, and needs assessment showed that evidence of damages and losses totaling 3.25 billion as a result of 2016-17 drought in Somalia, of which 600 million was registered by the environment and natural resources sector. You can get that report by Dina report 20. 18, D-I-N-A, uh, 2018. The other question that you have asked, which is the main areas uh, of the support needed from the international actors to advance integrated response to the climate threats in Somalia, if I summarize here, 
first one is building institutions, strengthening the system, and raving environmental governance across the across the government or the country. Why am I this? Because you cannot uh, uh, tackle with environmental issues or challenges on climate issues and shocks if there is no government capacities and national institutions and also the federal member state institutions if the capacity is not well established. So I think this is one of the challenges that we are facing. So we call the international partners to support in that area. And I think it will be available on our NDC update, which we are planning to submit uh, before COP26 uh, UNFCC. The other thing is that working on reconciliation, peace building and the state building from an environmental approach, making conflict more climate sensitive. This is another main area whereby all Somalis, they have a conflict on natural resources. And I think uh, uh, the climate shocks and climate changes are the ones who create the, the, the conflict between Somalis. Every day you can see through the media or the, 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 uh, 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 that the, some Somalis, they are fighting because of uh, uh, scarcity of water or maybe the, 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 the way the animals uh, used to get uh, grass. So I think this is one of the climate issues that our people are uh, uh, suffering. The third issue that uh, maybe the, the, the international actors can uh, in, uh, uh, get uh, but maybe support is that the climate mainstreaming to all partners, planners and programs. There is a lot of partners within Somalia, the UN, the, the, the government, uh, all the, the, the countries that have embassies here, and we are grateful that the UK embassy in Mogadishu actually is taking a key role where we had been agreed to do the, 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 the climate change uh, stakeholders for the last two months. And now there is a report coming out that the UK embassy in Mogadishu is, is, is supporting. And also we thank UK, in, UK embassy in Mogadishu that since they have already promised that the, the government of Somalia will get support in the preparations of COP26. Uh, a paradigm shift is needed, time to shift away from the humanitarian assistance into more development-oriented partners and collaboration. Yes, it is true that some part of Somalia need urgent humanitarian needs as we speak now. However, for more uh, three decades, this country has been receiving donations which actually has contributed to its fragility and I dividendsy. Somalia wish to do not remain sitting at the receiving end. We are ready to partner with all international actors to strike a balance between our aspirations toward development and humanitarian assistance. We wish to see more diversification, the economy, the livelihoods, poverty reduction, food security, green jobs, energy, investment and prosperity for all. Hey, thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yusuf, for sharing um, what is some, some very um, um, large challenges, but also I think expressing how um, perhaps working on the environmental issues and the climate issues could become a new entry point for addressing some of the institutional challenges and capacity building, and maybe we can see this as an opportunity for for addressing some of the longer-standing issues that have been um, that you've been struggling with for a long time. So thank you for that. Um, we're going to um, move from East to West Africa now, and Dr. Atukoyefio is going to take us um, to the Lake Chad Basin. Um, this is an area, it's a source of livelihood for 30 million people across Chad, Nigeria, Niger, and Cameroon. But the Lake Chad Basin is experiencing a complex crisis involving violence, terrorism, and conflicts over scarce natural resources. The AU regional strategy for the stabilization, recovery, and resilience of the Boko Haram affected areas in the Lake Chad Basin region is meant to be an instrument for addressing the root causes of violence in the region, fostering greater coherence across the many actors involved and devising tailored context-specific responses. In your capacity as coordinator of this strategy, please tell us, Doctor, how the regional policy has been successful in addressing the environmental drivers of the crisis 
and also complementing security interventions with development solutions to build the resilience of affected communities. Can you also share some good examples from, from the region of what they call climate proofing or successfully integrating climate risks into peace building and development interventions? And finally, to what extent would you say the policy has been effective in minimizing resource-based conflicts in the region? Over to you, Doctor. Thank you very much, uh, Sagal, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Aswan, for inviting me um, once again. Um, in response to your question, the, the first question on the extent to which the, the regional strategy has been successful, um, let me just say that in supporting the Chad Basin Commission, to develop the regional stabilization strategy. Um, we weren't just looking for a new arrangements or new programs, but we're also looking at reinforcing uh, old ones. And um, one of the plans that we've, we've sought to reinforce um, with the RSS, which, which is the regional strategy, is the Lake Chad uh, Development and Climate Resistance Plan. And um, this was, uh, signed in, in 2015, I believe, by the Council of Ministers. Now, what this plan does is that it identifies rainfall variability, it identifies pollution, and a couple of other uh, climate risks um, associated with that area. Now, in response to that, um, they talk about the need to ensure afforestation, reafforestation, soil and water conservation, climate smart, agric, uh, better management of water, and so on and so forth. Now, what the regional strategy does is to reinforce these initiatives as critical to building that adaptive capacity of people um, within that Lake Chad basin. And so um, in response to your first question, I would say that the, the RSS has reinforced um, this plan by the Council of Ministers of the Lake Chad basin um, region. Now, in terms of complementing uh, security interventions with, with development uh, solutions, I think it's important to, to state that right from the word go, uh, it was clear that the challenges in the late chat basin are not just of uh, um, security nature, but perhaps some uh, development content. And so the AUPs and Security Council in, in authorizing the multinational joint tax force um, in 2015 to, to confront the, the insecurity problem in the region, also asked the force to facilitate the implementation of overall stabilization programs in the region. Now, this was based on the recognition that although those kinetic activities are, are important to ensure stability, they do not address the root causes. And so the philosophy of the regional uh, strategy is to complement whatever gains that the MNJTF has made, uh, however modest these gains are, to ensure that the root challenges are, are also addressed. And so if you look at the nine pillars that underpin the strategy, you'd realize about five of them, you know, talk about things like socioeconomic uh, recovery, environmental sustainability, empowerment and inclusion of women and youth, education, learning and skills, and so on and so forth. Now, in terms of the, the actual implementation, of course, um, apart from, the, the, you know, perhaps just a slight challenge with regard to uh, fully operationalizing the structures for implementation, um, we could say that there are quite a number of activities that I would describe as perhaps livelihood empowering or, or opportunity enhancing within the, the countries or the areas where it's affected by the activities of Boko Haram in the Lake Chad Basin. Now, it's our expectation that such activities would improve the adaptive capacity of the people in that region uh, relative to their vulnerabilities and, 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 and as a result of that, yield a, a net result of, of perhaps some improved resilience in, in, in that region. Now, in terms of the, the good example, um, I, I can, of course, um, talk about the RSS because in addition to uh, all the things that I've talked about, it also emphasizes the need 
for the eight worst affected areas in the Lake Chad Basin um, to develop um, climate change fragility assessment. Now for us, introducing this into the conversation itself, it's, it's a huge plus. Uh, because then it recognizes that we need to go beyond traditional means of managing uh, climate change to introduce some more novel um, ways of improving that adaptive capacity of the people in, in that region. But in addition to that, um, the AU Sahel strategy, um, which is currently under revision, also takes a cue from um, the, the, the RSS in the Lake Chad Basin because it makes a um, it makes an attempt to ensure that um, the plan is climate climate proof. Um, we can also talk about the UNDP Regional Stabilization Facility um, for the Lake Chad Basin. And currently the UNDP, we believe, are also working on some kind of a strategy for the Liptako Goma area. Now, all these strategies um, take a cue from some of the best practices in the Lake Chad Basin, and ensuring that climate change um, issues or climate risks are integral to the deployment of, of the strategy. Now, in terms of um, coherence, I mean, for us in the Lake Chad Basin, it's been our key word. I mean, if you have a, a region where the challenges are not nation specific, but region specific, then obviously, you, you know, I mean, we believe that drive, you know, an effective um, policy that would ensure recovery and, and resilience it's important to ensure that all these things are coherent, especially when you have multiple stakeholders who are genuinely interested in bringing some change in there. Uh, it's important that you, you drive home that issue of coherence. And that's why for us, we are happy to say that we are following the new way of working um, that ensures that we all come around and uh, promote um, a, a united kind of agenda in, in that region. In, in operational sense, we have a regional um, tax force and clusters, which sits all the stakeholders and all the partners working in the region. And, and personally, I think this has been one of the significant achievements um, in, in so far as stabilization in, in the Lake Chad Basin is concerned. Uh, thank you very much, Saga. Thank you so much, Dr. Atukoyeke. That was um, really very helpful to hear. And thank you for um, uh, reminding us of the importance of you know, re reinforcing old initiatives and old agreements. You know, Some of this work has been done in the past and we're not always reinventing the wheel. It's about making sure that we implement some of the things that have happened before. And of course, the importance of all working together in a coherent manner. Um, our final panelist represents the voice of um, I would say civil society, but also the voice of youth, and I would say the future, therefore. Ms. El Saim, Africa has the youngest population in the world. In Sudan, 60% of the population are between the ages of 15 and 30. While young people in Sudan have been adversely affected by prolonged conflicts and climate change, they present a powerful force for transformative climate action. In light of this, how does your organization harness young people's contributions to climate adaptation, particularly in regions that are witnessing resource-based conflicts? And please share with us your view on the challenges and opportunities for enhancing the meaningful, meaningful engagement of young peace builders in climate affected regions in Sudan. And finally, as a member of the African group of negotiators, what are the main issues that you believe are of high priority to young people in Sudan and would like to see addressed in COP26? Thank you. Thank you very much, Sagal, and thank you for that one uh, forum for this host. Um, I'm so glad to be here with you all. Um, first of all, uh, Sudan um, is not only um, affected by, by the conflict. Um, the conflict is also affecting the environment in Sudan. Many of the areas that were actually a very tropical type, the forests are now an empty land because of the military um, uh, processes that happened there. Many of the very fertile lands became very uh, poor uh, because of uh, a lot of burns and a lot of uh, um, massive actions that happened in many of the conflict areas. Uh, one of the very much uh, rich lands in, in Sudan are not reachable right now because of the conflict itself. 
uh, for us, uh, conflict and um, insecurity affects climate change as well as uh, climate change affect um, peace and security in the country. As you mentioned, it's actually more than 60%. I think the, the number is almost uh, 64% uh, are uh, below the age of 30. Uh, yet, when we see them, most of the young people um, comes from where uh, the regions with high populations are actually the regions with the higher conflicts. And it's direct relation to the lack of um, services, but also the lack of natural resources and natural resources and climate uh, related um, catastrophes is very much affecting the livelihood of these people and these uh, communities. Uh, one of uh, the Security Council resolutions in 2018 mentioned that the number of the people who need humanitarian aid in Sudan um, uh, moved from 5.5 to 7.9 um, uh, due to the conflict and due to the uh, lack of natural resources and the droughts that happens uh, sometimes and also the floods that destroy the infrastructure and so on. And now with the COVID-19, the number actually went up to 9.1 million, which is uh, almost a quarter of uh, the population um, if, if we uh, calculate it uh, this way. Well, um, everything I mentioned right now is just uh, ink on paper and numbers, but when you come to the real world, when you come to the reality, you find most of the youngest population doesn't have access to, um, uh, like, let me say education, doesn't have access to uh, jobs, green or not green, this is a different thing. Um, well, the SDGs are talking about the uh, quality of education. I think in many countries, and Sudan is one of them, we should talk about having education in the first place, then we talk about the quality of the education. Also health services and, and, and sexual productive. Uh, we have the highest rates of maternity uh, dying um, during birth and so on. Um, lack access to water and sanitation and everything is very much linked together, uh, unfortunately, and we cannot say that climate change is um, innocent from what's happening right now. Climate change have the lion's share, let me say, of uh, the conflict and what's, what's going on. Uh, as you mentioned, also young people are the derivation of change. I think all of the world watched uh, the revolution we had uh, in uh, December 2018 until um, 2019, where uh, young people actually removed the dictatorship rule that extended for 30 years. Um, and I think not only in Sudan, but rather along the world in general, young people are always the most frank, the most courageous, and um, we do think with fairness. Uh, and I think our future means a lot for us and also for the coming uh, generations. Uh, Sudan Youth Organization is one of the um, African uh, organizations that try their best to actually reach as, mon as much young people as possible. We try to educate them about climate change and uh, the science behind it, the impact of it, the, the adaptation, the mitigation, and um, because there's a lot of doubt internationally about the linkage between climate change and um, conflict, we are actually advocating and trying to show people how much climate change and um, uh, climate crisis are linked to conflict, uh, especially that many of our members are actually coming from um, the region that um, the eighth Secretary General Ban Ki-moon mentioned as the first climate co conflict, um, which is Darfur, and they suffered a lot and they, saw, they mostly saw most of the horrible things that happened there. Uh, well, we are putting a lot of effort in actually reaching people in grassroots communities. COVID-19, of course, is not making our, our job easier, uh, because uh, only 40% of the population have access to electricity. So having Zoom with uh, rural areas is <laughs> very much uh, impossible. And, and even going there physically, which, which we used to do, is uh, very much uh, uh, restricted nowadays because of the COVID-19. But it's the only way to communicate with people, with farmers, with pastors. People in the front line of the climate crisis are these, and people are um, very most vulnerable. And actually, the main cause of many conflicts in Sudan are the, the pastors and the farmers. Uh, well, it, it, we can't do everything alone. So we are trying actually now to reach the um, 
the new government and, and the transitional government to actually open more channels uh, and make more space to the agenda of, of uh, climate change and also youth inclusion and peace and security together at the same time with their agenda items of the of discussion. And also, um, we are really hoping that the new mission UNITAMS can address these two linkage between climate change and peace and security and also the youth inclusion. Um, uh, it's very important also to highlight that one of the main uh, challenges that we face as youth-led organization is access to fund. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm the chair of the organization for almost two years now, and I think I can, uh, um, if I said that our annual budget exceeded the $20,000 or $15,000, I'm, I'm just exaggerating, it's, it's not even the, this number. Um, and uh, every time I meet people, they feel like they say we, they are very proud of us as young people. Uh, they think that we are doing very much good work and so on. But when we go to the actual talk about funding and how, about executing projects and so on, they just smile and go. So I think, I really think that if, uh, the world want the young people to take the lead. They should really give us um, the 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 seat uh, where we take the wheel and, and drive. Not only uh, say us nice words because the words doesn't really uh, do anything. Um, uh, you asked me also a question about me being a junior negotiator with the African Group. Well, I think uh, I'm very proud, first of all, with the African Group of Negotiators. It's uh, I never felt away from my family with them. They are always very much supportive. They care about the, the future generations and they always very much keen into um, uh, delivering the process for us and teaching us step by step how to take um, uh, the leadership in different agenda items and, and in the negotiation and so on. And I, I really am going to do everything to support the, the youth, uh, the junior uh, youth pro uh, negotiator program within the uh, AGN and also try to mobilize for more young people to be within the, uh, the AGN itself. Um, the agenda items I really need to say during uh, the COP26 and we really need to agree on is first of all, the climate finance. Uh, climate finance is a, a huge topic that we kept uh, discussing in the previous COPs and the previous years, yet we don't have a, a clear definition of what is uh, climate finance. Loss and damage as a country who suffered from a huge flood in 2020, I know how much damage climate change can cause. And I know that our government and our countries can know uh, that doesn't have the capabilities or the abilities or the financial resources to adapt with that. So loss and damage is one of the greatest agenda items I wanted to see. Um, adaptation is always key for Africa and building resilience and so on, but I think Article 6 with the market and the market mechanism is also very important because we are not, um, as you said all uh, before, yes, we are not actually contributing to uh, the uh, climate change and the global warming, yet we are the most uh, impacted with, with. So I think we deserve to uh, have a, a fair share and fair mechanism to uh, trade our carbon and so on. Well, I will end up with that. I'm very happy to see Selwyn, uh, our um, uh, godfather at the Youth Advisory Group, and also Sir Nicholas and Ahmed and others. So glad to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, that was excellent. And thank you for, for just reminding us about the importance of the role of youth and the importance of making space for youth and empowering and resourcing and truly giving them a seat at the table because this is this is about the future. Um, thank you to all the panelists. I'm going to bring in our two expert commentators now and they're going to um, share thoughts, reactions, insights um, from the panelists, from the topic of the panel, Aswan Forum. Please share with us um, you know, your thoughts. I'm gonna give you four minutes each um, if you can make it three, even better, but four minutes each. And we'll start with uh, Dr. Frank from the Munich Security Conference. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Segal. I know we are pressed for time, and so I make it two and a half minutes. Uh, thanks to the Aswan Forum, from one platform to the other, from the mother of security conferences to the youngest daughter. Uh, well done. What you've put on over the last couple of days was, was truly amazing. Uh, and we we'll look forward to cooperating with you in the future. See, I'm the odd one out in this panel. I'm not a climate change expert. Um, but I do think that 
this panel and the discussion per se needs a, a reality check, needs a challenger, someone that brings geopolitics back in because uh, the, the organizers have done a tremendous job at bringing a great group of people together with one slight disadvantage. We all believe the same thing. We are all the converted. We all know that climate change is real. We all know that Africa is most unfairly and hit hardest. Uh, we all know that a lot needs to be done. We know we need money from the international community, but there are others out there that aren't yet convinced that that are the ones we should target. And so let me just uh, mention a few red flags. Some of you may know that I've had the great honor to, to work for a great African, uh, Kofi Annan, for many years. And I remember 10, 15 years ago, we talked about the exact same things that, that you guys have just mentioned. And you know, 10, 15 years later, we're still there. And I'll come to the point, you know, at some stage, we need to make real and visible progress. We need success stories, not just drama over and over again. And maybe Lake Chat can provide such a success story. I, I thought what Philip said was, was very convincing and there is a clear pathway forward. And, you know, we need to find answers, not only to the questions of what we can do to protect Africa better against climate change, how to help Africa adapt and how to finance it all. Uh, but we also need, uh, you know, answers to the question of how we can avoid that the current energy transition process that the world will go through over the coming years and decades will not turn Africa into a loser yet again. How can we make sure this process is set up in a way that doesn't kick Africa even further behind? And we also have to find a question how to make the process of fighting climate change, of helping to adapt Africa, more resilient to the emotions of the day and especially to political change in important countries. What do we do if Trump comes back in 2024? What do we do if Marine Le Pen wins in France? You know, it, we are too dependent on visionary leaders showing us the way. We are too dependent on the greater Thunbergs and also Nisrin on, on you uh, of this world to, to keep the emotions alive. This needs to be inbuilt into the system and into the development paths. Um, and we need to find answers on how to instrumentalize the current pandemic even more Machiavellian than we're already doing that here and there. We need to make sure that we really build back better, that we really build back greener, uh, and that we help Africa to build up at all. And how, and I think that's a key question of the day, how can we encourage great powers to enter into a constructive, into a positive competition, a race to the top and not in a, a destructive competition as we see it at the moment. And we've had a huge event a couple of weeks ago and some of you may have seen it, where Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General said, you know, how the hell are we supposed to solve the world's biggest problems if the world's biggest powers are at odds? And I think that's a pretty damn good question. And you know, don't let us not get lost in the nitty gritty too often and sometimes look at the, the big geopolitic uh, behind it. And we as the Munich Security Conference will do our bit. We look forward to working with you in the process. Uh, and I can't wait to, you know, be back here in a year and see whether things have changed for the positive, because I, I think we really need it. We've had enough drama. We need success. Thank you, Saga. Thank you, Dr. Frank. Uh, that was, that was very, um very sobering and very hard hitting and actually very, very inspiring. Dr. Kramper, joining us from Sweden. Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to speak to you. My name is Florian Kramper. I'm a senior researcher at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute working on climate security um, issues. Um, I wanna maybe maybe start off from, from what um, Benedict Franke just said and, and reiterate the question. I think he's absolutely right. Well, I agree with some of the things he said, I'm not here to comment on him, but I think there is a, um, a, a start off point here that we need to take people along the way. We need to take the great powers along the way. And if you see the debate in the Security Council the last weeks, um, uh, we see that there are two and a half, three, countries that are not going along the way. Um, 
So I would disagree that we haven't come far in the, in the last couple of years. I think we have made tremendous strides in, in moving this agenda forward, not least in New York, but especially if you hear the examples from the colleagues on the ground, um, what is happening and the knowledge that exists in, in these places. Um, I think under this frame and as, um, Nicholas K gave gave us sort of the tagline here with urgency, ambition and inclusion, I think it's absolutely right. This is what we need. Um, and, and what that sums up to in, in the bigger problem, I think, is a question of cooperation. Um, we see a big dynamic, we see a big energy um, around the world. We, we have a change in the US government. We have COP coming up. There's a lot of positive energy on driving this agenda forward. What we don't see is a plan, um, but we need a plan. We need to know what works. Um, and that brings me essentially to the, the excellent examples, I think, that were given from the colleagues um, and, and highlighting not the negative story that we so often hear, and especially in Western media, I don't think there's always ever a, a positive news coming from, from Lake Chad or from Somalia. Um, but I think here we highlighted exactly those positive examples, um, the recovery and resilience framework, the work that, that uh, the government is doing with UNSOM um, and, and the work around the Lake Chad with, with this new frameworks. And most notably also the African Union, I think one of the most uh, inspiring institutions at the moment in the, in the field of climate security, really driving this agenda to a new level. Um, but cooperation also means not just engaging with these big organizations and, and as Nesreen um, um, mentioned and, and I think drove home the point excellently, we need that engagement with youth, um, but we need that engagement with regional civil society actors from all trades in this um, engagement, which brings me to the question of the second point uh, I want to raise, raise, which is the question of knowledge, the quality of knowledge, and what type of knowledge we are actually presenting in the discourse around climate security. Um, the biggest vulnerability, despite having made tremendous strides in the last years, the biggest vulnerability that we still have is the quality of the research on climate security that we present. If this is not sound, countries like the three I mentioned on the Security Council, plus others um, around the world that are doubtful and questioning this agenda, the Trumps of the world, the, the Le Pens of the world, um, will have the need to, to attack the agenda and, and we will never get to a point of cooperation. But we need this quality information to build this coalition. We need them to convince people of the need of action. We need that on the second track, to inform programming. If we don't have adequate knowledge to inform programming, be it the United Nations, um, various agencies on the ground, be it government actors, be it um, African Union actors, or be it um, small NGOs on the ground, we need the knowledge of what works and we need this knowledge to be sound, otherwise we are creating more problems. The last point, and that relates back to, to the, the bigger development that I think we have done over the last years, and, and I think um, and noted Selvin uh, was, was quite conscious in his formulations around climate-related security risks, which I think is one of the not often spelled out, but, un, uh, but most notable advances we have seen over the last couple of years. We are slowly crawling towards a uh, consensus. We're slowly finding a language that allows us to build this cooperation across uh, different actors. And the retreat from threat multiplier framing and the threat multiplier language towards a more inclusive framing as climate related security risks is actually allowing us to send not the wrong message, but the right message. A message that doesn't inhibit urgently needed action, but one that actually allows and encourages urgently needed action, something that encourages inclusive uh, uh, development-oriented solutions that we need. Um, because one thing that we know is that the human security risks that climate change is, is creating today are becoming the hard security risks of the future. But we also know there are no hard security solutions to that. Um, with that, um, thank you for hosting this excellent um, panel and to the Aswan Forum, congratulations for this event. 
we really look forward to continue this conversation um, in May at the Stockholm Forum for Peace and Security, uh, Peace and Development, um, which is a knowledge partner of the ASWAN Forum. We're really looking forward to have you there and continue the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kramper. That was excellent. And thank you, Dr. Frank. Those were some excellent um, comments on the interventions in our, of our panelists. I'm going to come back to our panel for closing remarks and wrap up. And I just want to ask you, building on the different insights we've heard today, how do you envisage the way forward? And in your capacity, what are the main action points that you want to recommend for all of us leaving here? I'm going to give you one minute each. We have five minutes left. So please work with me here. One minute to share. Closing remarks, takeaways. What do you see as the way forward? Sir Nicholas Kay. Okay, great. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to all the panelists and the experts for their input. Um, first comment I would make is that, yes, we have been admiring this problem for many, many years, but things have changed and things are moving. There is a momentum going on. There is no doubt about it. If you look at business and the private sector, for example, the race to, to zero is real as you've got major companies, banks, financial institutions, all committing to that. And now major countries as well, China with its ambition to be net zero by 2060, South Korea, Japan as well. Things are moving, there is a momentum. Is it fast enough? No. Is it going far enough? No. We need now plans, detailed plans between now and 2030. Let's forget 2050. Let's concentrate on how we're going to deliver up until 2030. Um, so three, three very, very quick things. Uh, from all our visits to Africa, the COP president designate Alex Sharma has been four times now just this year. Uh, what we're seeing is that Africa is, and African countries are not waiting for money to fall from the sky. There are so many good things going on there, committing its own resources to unconditional aspects of NDCs, financial innovations, talking about green bonds, African Development Bank, talking about the adaptation benefit mechanism. They're making difficult choices. There are difficult choices, let's be clear. As we recover, do we invest in dirty quick fixes or do we invest in renewable energy, for example? Many countries making the right choices and lots of technological, scientific, important things being done by the AU, as we heard in uh, the Chad Basin. Second point, we need from the other side of the equation, if you like, from the donor side, more concerted and more creative approaches to finance. Uh, and all those things are on the table. They're not sort of presidency positions, not UK positions, but special drawing rights, extension of those, looking at debt issues, private sector finance for adaptation, not just public, um, quantity and quality of international climate finance. I think we, we might have lost uh, Sir Nicholas Kay. Um, so I'll thank him for that. Um, can we move to Mr. Selwyn Hart, please? One minute. One minute. Thank you so much. Um, really great discussion, colleagues, and um, listening. Thank That's you so much. Accessibility, streamlining the GCF, the Jeff. I think Nick is back. He's back. Nick, can you hear us? You've frozen. Not... Oh, okay. So, Go ahead, Sal. Yeah, uh, okay, so I was just thanking Nizreen for giving me that new title and designation as Godfather, but it's a pleasure working with Nizreen and the other members of the Youth Advisory Group. And this is one of the points that I want to make. We need to empower young people. It, it has been a tremendous honor, privilege, working with these young people from around the world, the seven members of the Secretary's Youth Advisory Group. They've pushed us pushed us to uh, um, on the design and development of the Secretary General's climate strategy. They've challenged us. And I think empowerment across the various layers of, of, of planning and decision making and integrating the voices of young people, not only youth washing, but really having them fully integrated in planning and decision making is absolutely essential if we're going to make a dent on the climate crisis. So in terms of all other 
follow action. COP26 must, must ensure that we keep the 1.5 degree goal within reach. That requires credible indices and in to coal, um, which must be delivered at the end of COP26. And finally, as we need credible indices, we also need credibility on finance. And the finance package must be, the, we must deliver on previous commitments, such as the 100 billion. We must ensure that we can ramp up support for adaptation and resilience building 50% as suggested by the Secretary General. And we must ensure that Africa gets its fair share. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ahmed Yusuf, one minute, please. Sir. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate Sagal uh, Abshir <coughs> for having us, uh, the SWAM uh, Forum, given us this chance to share the experiences and the balance that the, every, <coughs> maybe the country or organization is working on it. My last uh, 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 suggestion is that the NDCs, where the, all the countries are working on that, uh, let us maybe uh put all our our, our, our uh, target and intention to how can countries implement seriously on uh, national uh, determinant contributions that the uh, countries are working on it, on, on it. somalia and actually for the cop 26 uh, will be very happy and that we are very ready to participate and actually uh, we, we are great actually to share the the, the the other countries and organizations that what is how can Somalia like overcome the, the challenges on climate issues, which is re really, I can say that it, it's going to be the first, uh, if not uh, second, uh, compared to all the countries in the world. So uh, my last uh, word is to work together and make sure the balance and the strategies are realistic and implemented and supported. Thanks so much for giving us this. Thank you so much. Dr. Philip Atukoyepio, please go ahead. One minute, sir. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Egal. And um, just to um, agree with, with uh, Keith that there is a momentum. And, and to tell Dr. Frump that 15 years ago, um, Africa or most African countries were basically coming out of a period where threat perception were, were focused towards uh, hard threats or hard security threats. I think there's a change in threat perception. Uh, we all agree now that issues about climate can eliminate us faster than, than we, we had taught in the past. And so I would say that that influences that kind of momentum. Um, and so for institutions like, like the ASON Forum, I think it's a good thing that we're having this conversation. Uh, we shouldn't get tired of having this conversation. We should press on with having this conversation. At some point, we will get that golden egg. Thank you very much, Aswan Forum. Thank you so much. And I'd like to call on Ms. Nasreen El Saim to give us that final minute. Thank you very much for this great um, moderation, Sagal. I'm very proud to meet you and also um, the other panelists. And uh, of course, thanking Selwyn back. <laughs> um, I think our, my final remarks will be that, well, there is no time for us to keep doubting about climate insecurity. Uh, it's already there. It's a fact. Let's talk more about how can we mitigate and how can we um, reduce the impacts of climate change and um, to stop having conflicts uh, over natural resources. Um, also, I want to say that if you want to be proud of young people, if you want to be happy with what we are doing and achieving, um, at least you can take part of it by um, helping young people in different manners. It can be mentorship, it can be finance access, it can be uh, skills teaching and so on. Uh, young people around the world have huge uh, powers and huge capabilities that needs a small push and a small window of hope so we can launch this uh, hidden energy inside of them and uh, please um, help young people around the world because we deserve to and we are the leader of the future as I always say. Thank you so much. Thank you all. This was an excellent panel. I'm going to try to take one minute myself to try to give you the key takeaways as I see it. Five points. 
Number one, everyone talked about the urgency. Yes, we have momentum, but it's not far, not fast enough. And this urgency is critical, not just an African priority, but a global priority. Number two, credible financing is incredibly important. Yes, we have a global economy that's reeling from COVID-19, but it's important. We're going to need the money to do this. And there may be more creative ways that we can think about it, debt, private sector, et cetera. But we've got to deliver on the promises that were made. And we probably need more money than those promises. Number three, adaptation is key. Adaptation is key. And in very fragile situations like in Somalia, this may even look like institution building from scratch. Number four, coherence, working together both horizontally with all the actors, as well as working with agreements and frameworks and strategies from the past. We know what needs to be done. It isn't unknown. We just need to do it. And number five, more work needs to be done to advocate, to continue to, com to convert the unconverted, to build the coalitions, and we've got to keep doing that. That's the five points that I go away with. Thank you all. This was a fantastic panel. And um, I wish you all the best for your day, for your week, for your month. And let's get to COP26 and like keep moving this ball forward. Thank you. Thank you, Aswan Forum. Goodbye.